hear your opinion. So put your hands together for Colin. Okay, people. Uh, I know it's just before lunch, and I'll try and keep you awake until that happens. Um, I am not going to mention any philosophy at all, zero, <laughs> except except that I get what philosophers are really good for, some terminology, and it's on about this fourth slide, and that's it. Okay. Uh, this is entirely science. That's me. I'm a scientist. Um, it's all about empirical evidence. Okay. In 1990, the beginning of the decade of the brain, the late Nobel laureate Francis Crick lent his imagination and energy to those scientists retrieving consciousness from the scientific discard pile. Empirical activity that explicitly targeted the dreaded C word slowly became acceptable science. That's the beginning of the decade of the brain, only 20 years. After 20 years, what solid science has been constructed? How well is it operating? And what are the prospects for the next 20 years? After 20 years, the quick take-home message remains in the negative. An engineer knows that if you can't build it, then you don't understand it. And there is still no account of consciousness that an engineer might use to construct a conscious artifact or to prove that consciousness is necessary, present, and is or is not operating in an understood role in an organism, in an artifact, or in an object. Why is this uh, relevant to here, to, to a singularity? Well, it speaks to uh, the need for a principled science of artificial general intelligence uh, that is critically dependent on the science of consciousness. The state of the science of consciousness means that nobody can claim they have a scientifically principled access to, to human level AGI. And all AGI development must be invested in unproven unpro presupposition of some kind. This fact applies to everyone in the business, including me. So when you look at the offerings of the AGI community, please wear the glasses of scientific wisdom and know that no matter how enthusiastically engaged, lack of, science of, conscious, uh, lack of a science of consciousness has involved itself in what you find. On a more positive note, uh, 20 years has given us uh, a small embryonic education system which did not exist 20 years ago. This is great, but it's not core business for today, so I'll just move right on along. Here's where we get our little bit of philosophy. Um, the terminology, I have to go through this, and fortunately you've been trained quite a bit so I can really read it fast. Um, there is a small lexicon that scientists now are becoming familiar with after 20 years. The words phenomenal consciousness refer to the collection of privately experienced subjective qualities, qualia, such as the redness of red that literally form our first person perspective. Visual consciousness refers to the specific qualia of the visual scene. Other scenes include audition, touch, taste, smell, emotions, thirst, pain, and so forth, including imagined, dreamt, and pathological versions of all of these. Phenomenal consciousness must be technically distinguished from states of consciousness, also sometimes called creature consciousness. States of consciousness are brain modes like sleep and coma. The science of states of consciousness coarsely informs the science of consciousness, or the science of phenomenal consciousness. For example, a coma brain state eliminates all phenomenal consciousness, but not being in brain state coma does not cause phenomenal consciousness. A scientist directing effort at, at a science of consciousness is ultimately contributing to a scientific account of phenomenal consciousness. To understand this, consider that if there are no qualia, then consciousness is gone. A dream of sleep is an example of that state. A final bit of terminology is that it is like something to have qualia from the first person perspective. You saw this before in that list of terms. Um, sleep at a moment without dreams is not like anything from a first person perspective. The like something phrase allows us to refer to the scientific target without prescribing a particular kind. We can also use this terminology to say that it may be like something to be a single cell organism, a bat, a computer, or a rock. And in the case of that bat, it looks pretty grumpy. Uh, if so, then each is conscious to the extent provided by its qualia, whatever they may be. A useful metaphor is to consider the brain as a content provider where the content is qualia, and the term is meant in the sense that it is like something to be in receipt of the content, but only from a first-person perspective. 
The science of consciousness is therefore more generally a science of the first person perspective. Right, what else has 20 years given us? Well, it's given us in the literature, if you inspect it, you'll find attempts to address four different questions. First, correlates. Is brain phenomenon ABC causally correlated with the subject's reported phenomenal consciousness? The second question you find is cause. Why is it like something from a first person perspective at all? Put another way, what causes qualia or what necessitates that qualia exists? Oh, I can see it. <laughs> Kinds. What determines the particular qualities of qualia? And finally, role. What role is subserved by phenomenal consciousness in humans? Evolution is selected for a highly energy intensive solution to involving phenomenal consciousness generation in brains. The very powerful survival benefit is highly suggested by this observation, yet a role is not obvious. Observe, next, that no amount of correlate science delivers cause. This is something people are going to really have trouble with. This is revealing not only about science of consciousness, but about science in general, and much more on this in a minute. Next, we have, from the 20 years, we have some answers to these questions. And these are they. Causes, kinds, and role are essentially untouched by scientists. Right? Scientific literature only covers correlates. We now know a lot about what does not cause consciousness. We also have a lot of correlates that science claims to have sorted it out. How can we have a large pile of scientific literature claiming to have a theory of consciousness and at the same time science cannot claim to have solved the problem of consciousness? So the plot is thickening. In the ABC correlates of science, uh, science um, we now know a lot about what phenomenal consciousness is not, not the things that do not cause it. I, uh, Christoph Koch covered these in last year's Singularity Summit. If you get online, and I think I put a web, yeah, that web link there, and he will address most of these um, in Christoph Koch's usual way. Uh, I won't go through them in any particular detail. Uh, and as you can see, we know a lot, a lot about what does not cause it in the brain. We can discuss it in questions if you want. More interesting than these is what correlates science that says, says consciousness is. Here we go back into 20 years of literature and we end up with a pile of theories of consciousness, all put into the literature uh, meaning that the problem is all over, it's done. Okay? We have a zoo of possible candidates. Why hasn't one of these ABC correlates been accepted? I mean, let's check out a couple of them here. We've got, um, we've got uh, quantum computation in brain microtubules, uh, one of my favourites. The electromagnetic field of the brain is conscious. That's from Sue Poppin in Auckland. Um, there's a global workspace theory by Bars. Um, then there's integrated information and uh, or uh, the Darwinistic competition between neuronal groups within an overarching re-entrant loop structure, blah, 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 blah. Now, I could combine these. For example, I could go the integrated information in the electromagnetic field caused by recurrent thalamocortical resonance mediated by gamma band frequency temporal coincidence is the answer you're all after. Let's all go home. <laughs> now, um, Again, why hasn't one of these things been accepted? If one of them is right, how would we know? If one of them is right, the science of consciousness is over. And after 20 years, we have no shortage of correlate-based theories of consciousness. So why am I standing here telling you there's no theory? It's strange, isn't it? An additional observation about the science of consciousness. Take a look at it. If you look a little deeper, oddity appears in the science approach itself. Consider this. Only neuroscientists are required to encounter and explain the third-person perspective and the first-person perspective. We scientists are clearly not operating consistently across the sciences. Why is no chemist expected to deal with the first-person perspective of a benzene ring? Doesn't mean there isn't one. And you could Probably would turn out that there isn't one, but a scientific account of the absence is nothing in the scope of a chemist's activity. 
Does this lack of attention to the first person by other sciences mean that correlate science is wrong? Or is it that neuroscience has something to teach all the other sciences? At this point, you go, time out and have a look at where we are. We have 20 years of empirical work, no explanation of consciousness, but multiple theories of it, any one of which could be right, and we can't tell. Only neuroscientists are expected to account for third and first person perspectives. How has this situation come about, and what do we do about it? The science of consciousness has ins inserted an in, uh, inconsistency at the heart of the sciences, and we appear to have techniques that are failing to, to deliver what we normally expect. A, uh, to get a handle on this situation, it clearly requires self-examination by scientists. Uh, we can look at, um, I've got down the bottom there, the first one is what constitutes explanation of a natural phenomenon? What are the possible kinds of laws of nature? When do we have evidence of them? Scientists don't, uh, don't ask these questions ever. They got an answer 300 years ago and the answer is still there in the same form 300 years later. So let's do an empirical study of scientists and find out what they actually do. I did this. This is a scientific study and it's the first time I've ever presented it to the public, right? except uh, uh, it's in the literature. Right? So you can find this, uh, this model in uh, one of my papers, which is in the end. This is what you, when you take all the behaviours of all the scientists as groups and involve critical argument and everything else, and you distill out the common factor across every scientist, there's 50 million or 60 million of us in the world today, this is what they do. I measured it. I have a more formal set theoretic version published in the literature. The deliverables of science, regularities in symbolic form, end up in the theorem bucket on the right. Sometimes I call it the truth bucket, but the tea bucket sounds better. Uh, consider cold fusion. Scientific observation led a couple of scientists, I think it was in the 90s, well, it was more than the 80s, to deposit in the tea bucket a symbolic regularity via path A on the right. They tried, uh, sorry, later on, other scientists dug the result out from the tea bucket via path B, and they tried to recreate the same scientific observation, failed, and the regularity went over via path C into the refuted pile on the left. From time to time, some scientists get rummage around in the refuted pile, dig out cold fusion via path D, and try again, and so forth. This is all simple enough. The really important key element of this process is in the middle, is that scientific observation is distinguished from scientific measurement. This simple act is a key insight. And that is that objectivity is mediated by the subjectivity of scientists. Scientific evidence originates in the qualia of the observing scientist. This means that a science of consciousness is actually the science of a scientific observer. The entire enterprise of, of a science of consciousness therefore exists at a boundary condition in the evidence system for the whole of science. Unless an experiment can be passed through the consciousness of a scientist, a law of nature will not end up in the tea bucket. Conversely, if a science result cannot be recreated to pass through the consciousness of another scientist, it will be forcibly ejected from the tea bucket. With the science process and the role of phenomenal consciousness in scientific observation clarified, let's take a look inside the tea bucket. All right, here we have three from the tea bucket, and looks like the apple doesn't like my alignment. Oh well. Right, more verbiage. Here are three laws of nature from the tea bucket. Number one shows the force correlate of acceleration, Newton's second law. Should be familiar to pretty much all of us. Number two is what I invented, the uh, armadillo population correlate of geographical location. Number three is a generic equation, so all laws of nature can be put into this form. The, the, uh, is, number three is the generic natural world event object correlate of the like this phenomenon. And you'll see that number one and number two are of the form of number three. 
And there are 300 years of these um, kinds of statements in the tea bucket. Now, the, every law of nature can be put in this form, not because of some overarching principle, but because they were all constructed using the procedure in the previous slide. Now look at what happens when we do ABC correlate science. I'll read it out. These neurons in this subject behaving like this result in a report of a red experience in the visual field area on the subject. Now, can any of you see that 4 is not the same as 1 and 2 and 3? Um, you can if you look at it for a bit, but I'll make it obvious. In 1 and 2 and 3, scientific observation resulted in a direct subjective experience in the observing scientist of both sides of the equal sign. When calibrated and agreed between observing scientists, we call this objectivity. In 4, however, here saying what it is like evidence from the subject is used to account for an additional phenomenon, the qualia of the subject. Why is this extra phenomenon not part of 1, 2, and 3? For example, why do we not ask what is it like to be max m in equation 1? Or what is it like to be 123 plus or minus 7 armadillos in 2? Or, what, or more generally, what, it is like, what is it like to be the natural world event object in number 4? This is a slightly more, uh, more formal version of the trans-science inconsistency shown a few slides back. But there's more. This inconsistency exists along, alongside a subtle sort of explanatory failure. ABC correlates are intended to explain a first-person perspective using third-person methods, and in doing so we find that all accounts are somehow devoid of actual e explanation, that is, cause. We may isolate the clearest, most repeatable correlate of consciousness, and yet we still be uninformed as to why qualia arise. We can go on indefinitely generating statements of type 4 and simply never finish. There's no real explanation going on. And why is this? Um, this issue is generalizable. Um, take a look at F equals MA. Consider that that statement 1 does not explain why F equals MA, as opposed to, say, F equals MA to the power 1.15. It's quite possible to say that the force causes the acceleration A, but this is not the causality I'm addressing. I speak specifically of what it is that causes F to be equal to MA in the first place. When you ask the same kind of question of equation 4, what do you get? We can claim that these neurons cause a red experience. No. We can claim that these neurons, sorry, but this is exactly the same as saying in equation 1 that force F caused the acceleration A. Why does F equals MA? It's ex exactly the same kind of question as what causes qualia, the unattended question in the list at the beginning of my talk. In this way, the science of observational correlates cannot claim to have ever addressed causality. Right. Let's go back and look at what I just said. The, the original questions, there were four, and I've left out kinds and role because they're subsidiary to the primary concerns here of correlates and cause. An analysis of scientific behaviour has now helped us properly understand the problem that consciousness presents to us as scientists. And it turns out the problem is not confined merely to the science of consciousness. Causes are completely absent from all laws of nature in the tea bucket. So, the inevitable conclusion of the analysis is that the laws of nature produced by scientific behaviour as currently practised are descriptive not explanatory. They are all correlates and no causes. The laws of nature produced by scientific behaviour as currently practised are observational correlates inside a presupposed observer that have no formal bearing on causality. All the laws of nature in the tea bucket presuppose the observer. Is it any wonder that an explanation of that observer is outside access to current scientific behaviour? The absence of, a, of a, an observer in the tea bucket science is actually well known. If you go and talk to physicists and chemists and everyone else, 
Yeah, they'll confirm. There's no observer in science. What this analysis reveals, however, is that the, this absence is matched perfectly across all of science by a total lack of any account of causality. So it's a problem for the whole of science, not merely a problem for a neuroscience called the ABC correlates of empirical, uh, empirical work. All right, it does get better. Let's take a look at this. All right. Scientists are, are uh, under-recognising, in fact, they're not recognised at all as evidence of anything. So intimately and critically dependent are we scientists on our consciousness that we can literally claim ourselves as scientific evidence of it. Aren't the deliverables of science, a tea bucket full of observational correlates, objective scientific evidence of the system that pr pr uh, produced them? Scientists are a natural phenomenon, like any other phenomenon, resulting from the causal machinations of the natural world. And there will be nothing in the tea bucket, in the strictest sense of causality, if the consciousness of the observing scientist did not at some stage include the supporting evidence. All physical statements of type 3 are the causal descendants of the consciousness of scientists through the act of scientific observation. And this is claimed to no less a standard of evidence than used anywhere else in science. And we have a tea bucket full of several hundred years of such evidence. Yet, in a science of consciousness, for reasons unknown, scientists are completely overlooked as a source of scientific evidence on it. It is as if we, we scientists observe evidence using our consciousness and then deny that the observation process has been evidenced. All right, here we go. Time out again. What can we do to address these issues? What we now know is that the problem of consciousness is not hung up on a lack of enthusiasm or a lack of methodological faithfulness. What we now know is that the problem of consciousness is hung up because the whole of science has never dealt with causality. So the way to proceed is to look at how we scientists can properly incorporate an empirically supportable treatment of causality into our working lives without affecting the existing correlative laws of nature. There's nothing wrong with our tea bucket. It's just that an explanation of consciousness will never be found there. If the laws of nature currently produced by our procedures are merely descriptions produced by a presupposed observer, then nothing except culture or habit is stopping us from finding additional forms of laws of nature that explain, in the sense of causal necessity, why things unfold the way they do. I have explored how to do this for about a decade. It's easy, and in some ways we already do it and don't realise it. I can't explain it, I have to show it to you. I can't explain it quickly. Marcus Hutta mentioned the cellular automaton. I think someone else mentioned one as well yesterday. Now I have a video and on this Mac it seems to actually work, which is amazing. Um, it's about three minutes long, but I'll only give you a taster at the beginning, but it's got explanations on it. Have a look at it. Been around for years. And don't get put to sleep by the music. Okay? Lightening up cells in a cellular automaton.
cellular automaton Big Bang. Okay, I'll leave it there. So you can see that amazing complexity can arise from very simple rules. So now, now you know that cellular automata are a collection of multi-stated primitives that have initial conditions and they have rules of state transition. These things are put on a computer and they're run. So let's look at how this relates to a, a way to scientifically access laws of causality in an empirically supportable way. I'm going to give you a little universe. Oh, sorry. Right, here's my little universe. Cellular automaton universe. Everything in this universe is 100% specified by initial conditions and rules of state transition. They are the laws of causality of a universe made of a set of primitives examined by this particular cellular automaton. Have these laws got anything to do with observation? No. But here's a subtle change. Here we have a scientist being expressed by the cellular automaton. He's the guy on the right. The scientist is part of the cellular automaton. The scientist is observing an object. So you can see on his left, right, your left, there's an object he's observing and there's some kind of uh, representation of that object existing in the brain of the scientist. The scientist is observing an object by means of cellular automaton behaviour inside the portion expressing the scientist's brain. So here's what the scientist actually sees. The first person perspective of the science has painted a portrait of the external world as it appears to our scientists within the cellular automaton and it's painted it like an apple. And we've just, well, done some science. Is calling Isaac, Isaac Newton and his apple. Notice there is regularity in the behaviour of the apple. Our scientist creates a law of nature. And with any luck, yep, aha, F equals MA. The regularity has nothing whatever to do with the rules of the cellular automaton, except that the cellular automaton generated the science and the apple and their environment. The regularity is an emergent property of the aggregate of the cellular automaton primitives denoted apple. So we have one universe, if I'm proposing this as a solution to another form of laws of nature that handle causality, and we have two kinds of laws of nature. One handles appearances, or what, the correlates, and the other handles causality, and why. This is the more complete model of how a fully matured science methodology would operate. It is an upgrade to the old system. But how do we empirically validate the additional cellular automata descriptive form? Everything has to be empirically based. Well, it turns out that to do this and to validate the, the, dual, the dual model, the dual descriptive model, the, the evidence is in neuroscience. The very first thing that the second set of descriptions must do is explain the scientific observer in neuroscience terms. It is as simple as that. In the paper, um, and the papers behind this work, uh, uh, one in particular, I've got a whole page of kind, the kinds of predictions that would, must be made by this new form, the cellular automaton. And so the very first thing that the new laws must do is therefore explain the scientific observer. The first thing. Not anything else. Nothing else. Then, both sets of laws, mutually consistent across the whole hierarchy of the sciences, have equal access to the same basic evidence system, the phenomenal consciousness of a scientist. So, oh, gee, I'm already finished. Lucky you. This is an overview of what I've been through and where we're at. So I'm going to read it out uh, blow by blow just to cement this thing in your minds. 
The science of consciousness is the science of the scientific observer. Objectivity is mediated by the subjectivity of scientists and surgically excises the observer from the laws of nature. Science is implicitly confined to description only laws of nature that presuppose a scientific observer and causality is currently missing from science. No living scientist explicitly chose to be in this situation. Inconsistent use of scientific evidence between neuroscience and all other sciences exists. Explanation of, of the observer is missing from science, while at the same time the neuroscience of consciousness is trying to explain the scientific observer. And also, finally, scientists are not recognised as scientific evidence of consciousness. Serviceable, and finally, I've shown you, serviceable additional laws of nature that handle causality are possible and go unexamined by science. So, having got to this place and been exploring this other side of science for um, between, or close to a decade now, um, I'm here to recommend three things happen. The first is that all physical sciences have entry-level training in the science of consciousness. There is no way we can even discuss this unless we all know that at least those first four terms in that early slide. Neuroscience and physics would then collaborate to explicitly document scientific behaviour on behalf of all physical sciences. Now I showed you the model the formal model I have is, I think I've got it on a slide somewhere down there. Uh, actually, yeah, well, as soon as I've got time, I'll show it to you. Um, da, 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 da. Just so you know it's real. This is all junk that I'll, I cut out of the talk. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. God. Here we go. Here's a law of nature from the tea bucket that defines scientific behaviour. It's self-referential and consistent. All laws have the form T N at the top, and T naught is the behaviour of scientists that do science. And the big word down the bottom is da uh, da da da. Must it uses experience as evidence of irregularity? That's what I've been talking about. So let's assume that physicists and neuroscience get together and they come up with something like that, or something they think is better, or I don't care. Uh, but it has to be done. The third thing is then that neuroscience and physics then look at options for different kinds of laws of nature with a view to explaining the observer and bringing causality into the realm of empirical access by scientists. I'm not saying that my cellular automaton model is the right way or the only way. I'm saying that a way exists to handle causality and we're not using it and we need to use it. There may be some other form it's not up to me to choose it. All I know is that, that the lack of options can't be used as an excuse not to do this. It's doable. And I think I'm done. I really don't. That's all I wanted to communicate for today. And I suppose we have to
science business that is fine and is sort of can get a scientific theory or have a scientific theory. So you're, you're presupposing that science is a completed behavior? No, my, my question is um, whether there could be a neurocorrelate theory of consciousness without talking about causality. No. Believe it or not. no, it doesn't, it doesn't explain anything. Why? Newton's law also doesn't explain anything. It just describes how things are. Yeah, it's just exactly. So you, Time to finish doing description only and start dealing with causes. And when we deal with causes, we'll be able to explain qualia. And only then. Okay, yeah, well, that's, the, that's the point. Then you just go one level down. Then you just yeah. suck again. What I'm saying is that we can describe the causality of the natural world in general terms. In fact, we should be able to have a cellular automaton that, from the point of view of an observer within it, should be able to conclude that F equals MA in another way by doing slices across a cellular automaton and comparing the, the progress of the changes in state of everything. Um, the process of doing explaining science does not deliver the experiences themselves. On the, uh, underneath all of this, there will be some kind of principle upon which the uh, existence of qualia must rest. But we're not even anywhere near that, and we'll never be near it unless we start dealing with causality properly. Um, to follow up on that, a lot of people would, would want to say that the Big Bang is an enormously satisfactory and useful theory of the universe, evolution, yeah. so on, for explaining natural mm -hmm. life. Um, and so, so might be a neural correlate style explanation of consciousness. And that, um, what would you have to say to people who would like to to discover consciousness in the traditional a causal way that seems to have been so effective in the past? Um, it will just never happen. So can I add on this yeah. the question? <laughs> do you believe that there can be? Uh, theory of the neural correlates of consciousness without talking about causality in the traditional way of you, know, you you measure the activity in the brain and you take the reporting and then sort of you try to build a theory. Do you think this makes sense or not? That is a descriptive theory of correlated phenomena in the mind of a presupposed observing scientist. Yes. Okay. That's not an explanation of qualia. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's not an explanation of qualia, but isn't yeah. this itself a valuable thing? It's oh, yeah, I'm not saying, no, I'm not, I'm not denigrating the process of the science. Hell, I love it. You know, I've been reveling in it for a decade. It's great. It's perfectly valid. Um, what I'm saying is that the reason why none of these things can get up and win is because we're not actually dealing with the ultimate causes. And once you do that, you can go through and see, oh yeah, that's probably, it's that one, not that one, and not that one, da di da di da oh, But this second conclusion, I don't buy, because in the other fields, you, you, you make up laws, you experimentally test them, and then they will fail or succeed, and you can do the same thing with your correlates of consciousness. I mean, people report something, you measure it, then you have this long list of things, and then you try to make a nice theory. You never finish. You, look, that, that's probably a point that you're trying to, that I think we're getting to. You never finish. Why? Because you can you can go, let's say you find the red neuron, right? Yeah. And you go click or press on a mouse and that optogenetically trigger the, the neuron to fire and the guy goes, Yep, that was red. And you don't do it and there's no red, or if you do it some other way or a different neuron you get yellow. And then you're sitting there with a the perfect correlate of redness. Yeah. And you're going Okay, now what? Why? Oh, no, you can't ask why. Now we talk to ah, so, science is, so science never, has never explained anything and never will. Is that what you're saying? Right. Excellent. <laughs> oh, that saves me a lot of trouble. I, I thought we were here to explain things. That's what everyone says. What do scientists do with that? We explain the natural world. What is an explanation? Explanation is a model yeah, which describes the phenomenon. Phenomenon, that is the thing that happens inside the head of a, an observing scientist, which we're trying to explain. The observation, the ability to observe it all. That, this is a cultural thing. It's not going to be easy to incorporate. 
We must remember yeah. that you guys are going to be on a panel together, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, and, and, and um, well, yes. can we continue this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Questions now, yeah. Right, well, we might as well move yeah. to yeah. Yeah. Randall. Randall. Yeah. Okay. Who's also going to be on the panel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. I, no, I'll let him know. I want to just so say quick. that, that um, I really appreciate the talk that you gave because I think that it is refreshing to talk about it. This way. So, so I've gone from being a coop to being refreshing. That's a, <laughs> that's a step in the right direction. And, and I know we've already spent a little bit of while, of while talking about some of the perceived differences in how we see things, yeah. where it turned out that a lot of what we ended up thinking were differences turned out to be mostly Semantics. difficulties in actually communicating what we yeah. mean by terms, which sort of goes back in a sense to what Marcus Hutter was saying about yeah. what his explanation is which is that really we've already decided, first of all, to set up some kind of way of representing it. So when you say F equals MA, for example, we've got, we've chosen a certain way of trying to describe the universe, and within that, we set up an explanation. So that's the first part of it. The second part is that um, there are a, lot, a number of assumptions that go into what you just talked about as well. For example, you say that in the scientific process, every one of these observations has to go through the conscious observations of the consciousness mm -hmm. of the observing scientist. Now, that already assumes that we have some understanding of what we're talking about when we say the consciousness of the scientist. So that well, we understand yeah. it means to say that they have to consciously process that. Because to me, this isn't obvious. Because I think, for example, that it's quite possible that most of what the scientists are doing then, as with everything else they do all day, are a whole bunch of parallel neural processes that are completely subconscious. And then consciousness and the awareness of what you're doing is something that could be emerging as an after effect. So it's not necessarily this big thing on top of everything that's guiding and steering. Yeah. And there's even some evidence to show that we make decisions. Okay, well, th this is like, there. it's one of those awkward situations where um, you're required to provide an, uh, an example of where the law of nature is delivered without phenomenal consciousness being involved. And you can't do that. So, from the point of view, of it, you know, you're, you're presupposing that it's possible to do it without it, and we have absolutely no evidence. This is about evidence. Absolutely everything in that tea bucket came from a scientist, and the scientists, if you if you disable or interrupt or interfere with their phenomenal consciousness at all, everything goes down the toilet. It doesn't work. So, from from that point of view. So uh, where are these scientists that don't uh, actually look at anything? Like, if everyone could close their eyes now, like that, right? Now, what you'll find is that the complex visual phenomenal consciousness that you previously had has been replaced by a roughly hemispherical blackness with some possibly blobby bits, especially that blobby bit up there where the light is. Uh, and whilst you're in that state, your ability to scientifically hurt observe something is somewhat limited. Right, and so that's what I'm talking about. To you. This is the thing I'm trying to say. It's not necessarily about the qualia of the individual scientists. Those qualia, sure, we can say they exist if we have a good description of what that word is. So I can assume that every one of us has a slightly different setup of how we interpret things, how we associate things, how we... Well, I'm not talking about everyone. I'm talking about how scientists deal with it. But the reason why we end up with these laws is because the scientists are coming to an agreement on how they are observing and experiencing certain things to the okay. point yeah, that's that you can make that observation something more formal than okay. simply the science the subject. Okay, uh, the yeah, that's what I showed you. Start to build artificial scientists in a sense that are doing all this exploration and fear of proving, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that, that's one of my favorites. That's what I'm doing. There it is. All right, now, I've got everything in there, and this applies to groups and individuals. The natural world, in the context of being a human being, being scientific about the natural world, behaves as follows. To manage and create the members of a set T of statements of type TN, each of which is a statement predictive of a natural regularity in a specific context in the natural world, external to and independent of the human, arrived at through the process of critical argument, and that in principle can be refuted through the process of experiencing evidence of the regularity. Now, to me, that describes every scientist on the planet, at least in their overall function in, in, in 
describing the natural world. And it's got everything in it. Critical argument is actually optional because a one scientist on his own, without arguing with anyone, can actually come up with the law of nature and quite often have. For example, Isaac Newton. That, that, that slide we for example, the first three examples are the results of a reductionist science process over... Which four um, examples are these? The four examples. Oh, yeah. And yeah. The, the first three are, are the results of reductionist science in a very simple situation. But the fourth one is an emergent property of a complex system. I don't see how you can... No, it's, what I'm, the point of that whole exercise was to show you that you've got all these laws of nature that have the same form the reductionist form that you're talking about. And then all of a sudden we've got this strange law of nature that's only done by its neuroscientists that has an extra thing to explain. That's the point of that, those four laws. I'm not saying it's not reductive. Like In fact, I'm not... I'm not sorry? It's, it feels like an unfair comparison to me with those it's three and the fourth one. Unfair? Well, I mean... The, it's just a, a, a statement of empirical fact. I know, I mean... Well, no, but the fourth one is a, an emergent property of a complex system, and the first yeah. three aren't. And it'd be like saying, for, the, for F equals MA, now describe the universe in total, uh, and, and you can't do that. The first three are simple, simple samples from all of them. It's 300 years in the tea bucket. I could have dug out something horrendously complicated and stuck it in there, and it would have been, it would have described emergent phenomena in something or other. I don't know, the expression of a tissue by, uh, or a, a liver by a cell, I don't know. They're all the same, except for that one number four, which is only done by neuroscientists. And I'm drawing attention to, to that for everybody to look at. Isn't that strange? Why is that? Now, it's either invalid science, or everyone else has got something to learn from it. And I'm exploring what that lesson might be. And I'm presenting it here today as a possibility. I hope uh, more convincing than I appear to be. <laughs> uh, up the back there. Uh, yeah, you should be your guy. <laughs> Between neuroscience and cognitive science, there's a magical boundary where, um, in fact, I don't know what physiology is. Physiology should be lower down. I don't know where the, how that got there. Psychology and cognitive science are where you tend to find that kind of thing. But they're not the explanandum. In that state, they're evidence. Right? Neuroscience of consciousness is specifically targeting an explanation of first-person perspective phenomenal consciousness. So there's a, a subtle difference in the handling of the information. It doesn't, you know, in fact, it's sort of supported in that the science itself is recognising the fact that these reports exist and that there is something to explain. So you can use it as a kind of support for the process. Um, yeah? Uh, I'd like to make an analogy, and I'd like you to tell me whether this is fair. Uh, going back to a cheering, uh, the, the decision problem of whether all mathematical problems were computable. This yeah. could only be solved when we turned our informal ideas of computation and proof that mathematicians had been using uh, for centuries successfully, and we made them formal, and we made them part of mathematics. 
So are you suggesting that we should, that similarly our ideas of science rely on this informal notion of observation and phenomena, and we, and we need to make this informal notion formal and part of science? I don't think that the second the second aspect, that, that question is too hard to proceed. <laughs> um, I think that the uh, manner in which you intend the word formal to be used is not the manner in which I'm meaning the descriptive domain that handles causality. Um, but I'll be happy to discuss this with you afterwards. There's, there's a lot in that. As usual, you asked a nasty <laughs> question. <laughs> Drat. <laughs> um, anyone else? It's, 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 it's example for the kind of special case of the general question, why the laws of physics as they are? Yeah. So it is. That's, that's it, yeah. Why so are they the way they are? They're, they're something as opposed to something else. Yeah. Why is that? We currently don't address that scientifically, and I'm just saying that if you do that, it, it has a bearing on conscious on an explanation of consciousness as well as everything else. Isn't that a bit of a mug's game though? If you push to say the laws of physics are the way they are, we've got the correlation. You're saying why are they why are they that way? I mean you imagine the server of automated scientists going, you know, why does the game of life follow this particular law? <laughs> there is no answer to that maybe. Or even no, if you're saying like, why is it why like that? Just keep going why. So, um, unless you could say it necessarily had to be this way, so the only way the universe could be logically you're done. All right. I, th I think this, again, this is a, alludes to the reality of being inside the system you're describing. I'm not saying that we will ever truly understand the, ne the, the ultimate necessity, but what I'm saying is that we currently just don't describe that necessity at all. Right? There's nothing in, in the F, there's nothing that we understand com compels an F in F equals MA to exist at all. If you address this way of describing things, then you can at least come to some understanding of where that came from, where we currently have none. So it's a way of exploring it. So in fact, there's, the re there's reality, and then we're inside the reality, and we've got two alternative ways of describing it. And not only that, I would say they're not unique either. There's nothing sacred about any particular representation in either domain. And the other point which that alludes to is the act of being scientific in this other domain is to uh, dump a pile of cellular automata on the desk of the publisher in a current state, or a snapshot of it, or slices through it, represented statistically. It's a different kind of behaviour, uh, and it has to correlate across all sciences. And in fact, the science overall is better founded because it has the two separate descriptions have to exactly um, relate to each other or one of them's wrong. So there's lots of practicalities to be gone through, but the concept um, seems cogent to me. Is there anything else to add? Uh, what, what form would you say the subject, um, the subject notating their experience before, like what, what form would it take? Are you sort of saying that there would be a psychology of your observations, what state you're at when you observe, and what you've been doing, and what your emotions are like, what your outside life is. Um, no, no, I don't. I didn't intend that that kind of concern. Um, I, in fact, I, I really don't understand the question, frankly. <laughs> The, the, the act of delivering a cellular automaton as a piece of science um, and then being asked to look at it and say, yeah, qualia are right there. Okay. Now, in my particular case, I've rummaged around and I've found what I think they might be and I'll be out, given money, <laughs> am I out there? Um, I'll be able to show um, slices across a multi-dimensional cellular automaton that, with properties that correlate highly with with um, subjective experiences in a way that's explanatory, the current isn't there. So um, I'm not going to taint the whole process with my prejudices about what that is. All I'm saying is that if you don't even start doing it, you'll never find out.
And I could be wrong. There might be some other thing in there. But I, I've, I've been rummaging around for a while, so I've got a bit of a head start. So final, final question, Meredith? Meredith, yeah. I don't know whether this is a question or a, a comment, and I'm not sure that I want to want a, 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 a response from you. But I'm happy to be quiet. <laughs> I mean, digging a big hole, I can stop. I guess this is a correlate from what um, uh, you've been saying, and it and it's this: it sounds perilously close to theology. <laughs> Uh, but by which yeah, you okay. mean, theology is a whole field of trying to explain something which seems ineffable and imminent. Uh, I'm saying it's not ineffable, and ineffable whatever that is. It's well, effort, lots, of, effort. lots of people have been doing this for a long time. They just seem to be going around around circles. Uh, yep. But the the way of stopping going round and round in circles is to say it's a meaningless question. Uh, why uh, is a meaningless question? I think there are plenty of things to be found out in that the domain of why. And, that we can, and unless we and abandon it from a point of view of some kind of, of, of uh, measurement, doing it, we're really abandoning, abandoning something without even trying it. I think we should try it. and then. I'd be happy for people to try it and then say, no, nope, it's a load of rubbish, let's stop it. Fine, but if you've never tried it, um, you're not doing anything from the point of view of um, uh, any kind of authority. You've done it in a, in a rational way. Then you can well, may I suggest then that. that you go to the Catholic Church to get your funding? <laughs> no, I think that's that's you're saying the society. Society. You're well, saying the why is physical. That's what yeah, it's think. physical. Everything is physical. So he's not saying theology. I'm not saying it's theology. theology. Nothing's imagined. The idealists are wrong. Yeah, right? It's as simple as that. But then, I mean, I can answer you why is f equal m times a? Because it's an approximation of general relativity theory. Which why is one does general thing. relativity exist? Because it's a necessary consequence of string theory. Then you ask why is string theory true? So we can ask why, why, why? This has nothing to do with causality. And at some point it needs to stop because we can only conclude something if you start with some assumptions. Right? Mm -hmm. And at some point it stops. You cannot conclude anything from nothing. Maybe we shouldn't stop. Maybe we should just keep trying to push up against Yeah, yeah. Okay. you can continue forever. Sorry, okay, you can continue forever, but it will not stop this process, right? I was in a bar once, and a guy, <laughs> the guy, <laughs> we're talking, blah, 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 blah. Where are you from, Australia? I said, oh, well, I once went, oh, oh, I was going to move to Australia. I said, oh, why is that? Why, why didn't you go? He says, because I live here. Said, <laughs> 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 that's what I just heard. <laughs> That's my point. Yeah, well, there's, the subtleties of the word why are really intricate. You I, can I ask how. Usually God. science asks. Why is the time Yeah. And really. Yeah. I'm glad I've got you thinking about this. This is good. <laughs> yeah. right? If I've achieved that, then I'll be a happy camper. Mm. Right. Can I be let off the hot seat now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>